We're going to jump back in where we left off last week. Last week we talked about the all-important uh, key of context in understanding Scripture, and, and that's really a place we want to start is to get to the original meaning of Scripture, thinking about context. But I want to continue tonight uh, thinking about as we study the Scripture, how do we get to the original meaning? Because that really is the, the first step in understanding and applying Scripture, I wrote this verse down here on your notes, Romans 12, verse 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may, be, may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. I think there are two aspects to salvation, when we think about it, that are important to understand. Uh, the first one is conversion, or what Jesus said in the Nicodemus, to be born again. That means uh, to be spiritually awakened or made alive. The, the biblical truth is that we are, Paul said, born dead in trespasses and sin. Spiritual death exists in us. And to be born again, to be converted, is means to be brought from death to life. And what I find is there are a lot of Christians who when they emphasize salvation to them the big emphasis of salvation is simply eternal security. That I got my passport stamped and I'm going to heaven. And, and listen, <laughs> and nobody rejoices in that more than I do because I realize how little I deserve heaven. Okay? And I'm grateful God made a way for me to go to heaven. But one of the things I fear in our Christian culture is that there's another aspect of salvation that we've got to be real serious about, and that is the conversion and the sanctification. Not only the security of our salvation, but the growth in our salvation. Paul talks about it there. He says to be transformed. And he's not simply saying it's a one-time event that you go from being lost to saved. But it's a continual process, the, pro the process of continually being transformed. And how does he say that happens? By the renewing of what? Of our mind. As we intake biblical truth into our mind, the Holy Spirit helps us to process that and to apply it and integrate it into our lives. It works its way in our heart and then works its way out in a life that is transformed. I, I really appreciated something Paul said today at the memorial service. He talked about the fact that his whole life he was around the church. And remembered when he was baptized, he said, but it was in 1980 that I was really converted by the power of God. And, and he talked about that's when changes really started to happen. As a Christian, we should be in a, con a constant state of change and growth in our relationship with God. So, so I share that to say all of what we're talking about is important because it leads to that transformation. It's not an end in of itself. Our, our goal of Bible study is not to simply figure out what the original meaning was. We want to take it further. And so I put down here this next sentence that the goal of discovering the original meaning of the text is to make a connection, now here's your three spaces, to make a connection from them to we to me. That's what we're going to be looking at over the next few weeks. How do we make that connection in that process? Now, we're going to talk tonight a little bit about first discovering the them. And here's why I say them rather than then. The book or excuse me, the Bible is predominantly a book written by somebody to somebody's, right? A book, we looked at the context last week, it's a book written by God to people. And so one of the things we really want to discover in Scripture is what I would say the humanity of it, the humanness of it, the, the message to people. Because ultimately that's what it is. God communicating to people. I was talking to somebody yesterday and he was talking about how uh, 
and, and he's really got a desire to grow, and he was talking about his struggle in reading the Bible. And I run across a lot of people that say, I struggle to read the Bible. And I told him, I said, well, I think the reason a lot of people struggle reading the Bible is we, we look at it the wrong way. You know, I, um, I've always been a slow reader. And I have to find things that really capture my attention. And I have to work to try to make it personal. I might struggle reading a book or whatever, but when I get a text from my daughters, I don't struggle with reading that. No matter if they're telling me that they tore up something on their car and they want to know how I can fix it. Because I don't see it as letters on a page that are going to take up my time. I see it as communication between somebody I love to me. And I told this young man, I said, listen, when you go to the Bible, don't think of it as just a book of facts and stories. I said, think of it as it is, God communicating to us. And then I think that really will change our perspective. So as we think about this goal of discovering this book of from somebody to us, the first goal is discovering the original message is the them. Now here's how I define that. That the Bible's written to people from God to address specific issues in a specific time and context, right? I mean, if we go uh, to Paul's letters, they were written specifically to churches. Paul had gotten word that they're dealing with certain issues. He wrote to address those issues, those doctrinal concerns. If we go back and look at the Old Testament books, a lot of that was... God reminding his people of his great and mighty acts in the past to encourage them and strengthen their faith in the future. You think about Ecclesiastes, you think about Proverbs, you think about the Psalms. The Psalm, in a lot of ways, was, in, was written to instruct us in how to be worshipers of God. The Proverbs, how to just not be dumb, right? I mean, that, you know, that's, somebody says, what's the book of Proverbs about? You know, don't be stupid. You know, that's, that's what it is. And in, in Ecclesiastes, you know, how to live life well and understand the meaning. So written to specific people for, for specific times. Now, here's why that's important because we can't understand correctly and faithfully, and I put that word faithfully in there because the Word of God is so holy and unique, we want to be faithful to its meaning, right? Right? So we cannot understand correctly and faithfully what the Bible means to us until we first understand what it meant to the original people, right? So that's where we start with the them. What was the message God had to them? And then we move from that to the we. Once we discover what the original audience, them, would have understood and, we, and, and how they not only would have understood it, but What's an important part of knowing the Bible? Application, right? I mean, let's face it, most men don't like to take medicine, right? It doesn't do any good to go to the doctor, say, Doc, I've got all these symptoms, and the doctor looks at you, they run all those tests, and he says, okay, this is what you've got, and I'm going to write your prescription, and then you go down to Publix, and you wait, and you pay for that prescription, you take that medicine home, and you sit it on the counter, is it going to make you better? What do you got to do? You got to apply it, right? You got to either swallow it, rub it on, or whatever. I think that's the way a lot of people go to the Bible. They go to the Bible, they get the meaning. But what does James say? Don't only be what? Hearers of the word, but doers. You know what doing means? It means taking the truth we've learned and through the, the wisdom of the Holy Spirit and the wisdom of other Christians, applying that spiritual salve and truth and medicine to our significant problem. And so, once we discover the them, we want to discover the we. We want to see, okay, how did the original audience understand it and how did they apply it to their life? And then, I think here's part of the challenge of Bible study,
we have to bridge the gap, right? I've got a, a preaching book in my office that's, that's one of the most probably well-read and respected books on preaching. It's by a man named John Stott. Anybody familiar with John Stott? John Stott was a, a British preacher. Uh, if you ever want to read really some good theology and stuff, uh, he passed away several years ago. But excellent, excellent stuff. But he wrote a preaching book, and he, and he titled it this, Between Two Worlds. And in that preaching book, what he helps preachers to understand is that our job is to bridge that gap that exists between the biblical world and the world of today. And that's what you want to do when you study the Word of God, is you get that them meeting, you say, okay, it's 2,000 years now, we believe the Word of God is, is never changing and it's eternal, right? That even though its truths were given in a distant time, its truths are still relevant. It's interesting as over the years in culture and other disciplines, there were things that used to be believed that were true, now we know aren't. Many years ago, when somebody got sick, they believed that if they would let out enough blood, they would get better. In fact, I, what, didn't one of our presidents die because they, which, was it George Washington? George Washington got sick, and they said, well, we just let out a little blood. They let out a little bit too much blood, and he died, okay? Hey, I'm glad we've advanced past that, okay? Or they used to put leeches on you, and they felt like the leeches would suck out the, the bad stuff. Did that creep anybody out? I'm glad I didn't go to the doctor and he say, well, we got this jar of leeches, just sit down. What, what? But, you know, in, in business and in medicine, um, people used to believe the earth was flat. There are still some that do, and we won't talk about them. But people used to actually be afraid that if you went far enough out in the ocean, you'd fall off the earth. Well, we know better now, right? And now because of that, we can enjoy global travel and cruises and things like that. I'm glad our knowledge is advanced. But here's the thing. We will never advance to the point where the biblical truth is not still biblical truth today. And so as we discovered the them and what it meant to them back then, we, we discovered then what it means for we. Now, here's the third one. The me. Because let's face it, one of the easy parts about Bible study is to say, okay, God was addressing a problem with them back then. Maybe it was unbelief or a sinful habit or something else. And sometimes it's easy to bridge the gap. I know some people just like that. Right? I, you know, them folks over there, they, they act like that. But but you know what the, one of the most important steps is? To say, okay, what does this mean for me? I love in, uh, is it, let's see, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, maybe where, where Paul, he says, do you not know that the sexually immoral and the murderers, and he, and he puts out this list of, of, of behaviors, and he says, do you not know that the people who practice these things will not inherit the kingdom of God? Now, it's easy for us to read that today and stop right there and say, boy, I know some people like that. I know about that LBGTQ crowd. I know about that fellow over on the other side of town that is mean to his family. I, I know about that, that swindler over there that cheats people. Paul anticipated that. And listen to what he said. He said, and such were some of you. But you were washed. You were changed. Now think about that. The them was, here are the actions of humanity brought about by sin that leads us to a realization that we've never been born again and that we're going to die and be separated from God. And another part of that them is, but they heard the gospel 
And no matter how deep they were in sin, God changed their life. And you think about the we. The we tells me, well, no matter what the sin is in my life, God can change me. And if we've been changed, another part of the we is, no matter what the sin in my neighbor's life that I may think is hopeless, God can change them and he may want to use me as the change agent. So we want to go from the them to the we to the me as we study Scripture. We, we want to ask the big question as we look at a Scripture, what is the takeaway? What does this mean for me now? You know, on Sunday morning, what do I share? The big idea. What I want you to walk away on Sunday morning is with that nugget of truth that you can put into practice or that you can believe or do in your life. So let's talk the uh, rest of our time tonight. i got a meeting at 7, so i got to watch the clock tonight. So let's talk about how we discover the them part of this. How do we, when we open up Scripture, how do we get to determine what did God mean to the Israelites in the prophecy? What did God mean to the pagan nations in Genesis? What did God mean to the church in Corinth or the church in Ephesus? What was God trying to communicate to those people? So we want to discover the meaning of the original office. Now there's several things we need to consider as we think about how do we find the original meaning to the audience? And we want to answer the question, and, and I've gotten to do this when I prepare a sermon. And I read that text, and I read that text, and I dwell on this question. If I'm the person that sat down and read this originally, how would I have read it and understood it? See what I'm saying? If I, if I am living in Israel and my historical religious tradition is Judaism, but my family has kind of moved from that, I, I'm, I'm generations removed from, from the captivity years and, and my, my social thing is where we no longer worship in the temple and stuff and, and I know that my forefathers were punished by God and all of a sudden we get Malachi the words of the prophet if I'm that Israelite sitting down in that time period what are those words going to mean to me you think about how Malachi starts off God says y'all don't love me anymore and they say well God how have we not loved you and what does he do? He, he indicts the priest. He, he says, you know, you no longer give sacrificially. So how would an Israelite understand the corruption of the religion of practice of that day? How would an a, a, a Israelite understand God's indictment of them withholding, bringing their tithe into the storehouse? So that's the questions we're asking. How would that person have originally understood it? And the first big thing we want to get at is, number one, is to understand the setting of which it was written. Everything in life happens in a certain, certain setting, right? I mean, we're in a setting right now. We're in a... Uh, a physical location in a regional location. Let me ask you, does the, the setting in which a church is situated in America, does that determine a lot of ways some of the things it does? I was just talking yesterday, T.J. Chestnut's here with uh, his pastor from the church in Boston, First Baptist of Salisbury, Boston. And I would imagine... And I did as I talked to them. Ministry looks a little different in Boston than it does here. Okay? So there's a setting. There, there is a, you know, there's the, the cultural setting. There's a regional setting. There's a time setting. 
So everything occurs in a setting. And so what we want to do is we read the words of Scripture to people. We want to ask the question, okay, what was the immediate setting they were in to help us understand it? Now, there's three aspects to the setting that is really helpful. Now, now here's why I think this is so important. I am a word picture person. Anybody here a word picture person? I, I love to build pictures in my mind to help me understand things. What happens when we begin to understand the setting is it helps us to put the puzzle pieces together. It helps to, to build a picture in our mind to grasp a better understanding of the original understanding and meaning of the text. So number the, under A, first of all, is the historical setting. History is in the process of being written, right? The present today will be history tomorrow, right? We will be history. Fifty years from now, people will be talking historically about a group of people who met at Northside Baptist Church and had Bible study. So we want to first discover the historical setting. The Bible is based in history, unlike other religious writings that are based in mythology, superstition, or philosophy. If you look at Hinduism, Buddhism, other world religions like that, that, that seek to answer the questions of life, a lot of them are based on either one person's interpretation of life. I mean, Confucius had a, an interpretation of life that was his, right? Uh, some of Islam is based on the historical person of Muhammad and his teachings. One of the things that makes the Bible unique is it is a historical book. It, its truth is based in God's historical interaction with people in settings and times and situations. And so the, this historical setting is we... It seeks to understand the immediate political, social, and even the personal situation of the writer who is writing the words or the people who are receiving the words. Uh, let me give you some examples. If you were to take Psalm 51, you remember what Psalm 51 is? It's David's confession and repentance, right? Let's say... You would just take Psalm 51 and hand it to somebody who had never read the Bible and say, okay, I want you to read this and tell me what it means. Well, well, obviously, they would have some idea that the guy that's writing it has offended his God and he's trying to make amends. But let me ask you, does it help us to understand Psalm 51 in a greater way when we go back and look at the historical context of David's sin in light of it? It does, doesn't it? it? It makes the idea of repentance and contrition and, and, and a desire to make amends much greater. To realize, hey, the guy that's writing these words is a guy that offended a God who has blessed him greatly, who had given him a wife, but yet he had taken another man's wife and he had had that man murdered. You see, the historical setting of Psalm 51 really makes it personal. Where David says in Psalm 51, God against you and alone, you alone I've sinned. Now, David's sin hurt other people, didn't it? It hurt Bathsheba, it definitely hurt Uriah. I mean, he was killed. It hurt his family because God said the sword will never leave your family. But knowing the history of David's interaction with God as God's anointed helps us understand that it ultimately was a sin against the holy God. So, personal setting. There are other times that people in Scripture, when you, when you know about Solomon's life and the his, history of his life, you begin to understand why in, in the book of Ecclesiastes, he says riches and knowledge and wisdom and all that stuff, it's meaningless. That was written by a man that had all those things and found at the end of those pursuits, emptiness. That helps us understand it. Um, it helps to know the historical setting of the early church that Peter wrote to when he said, look, you're strangers and aliens. And, and to understand the persecution they were under and why they needed to hear those words. Um, 
the political persecution of that day. I tell you, if you understand the historical setting of Rome, you get a greater sense of the challenge the early church had and their deep dependence on the Holy Spirit rather than programs and buildings and all those things because they didn't have any of that. So the historical setting is very important. The, the where it's occurring, the when it's occurring, what else is going around, along at that time. The second one, B, we want to know the physical setting. Where is it happening? Does that make an impact? The geographical setting? It's important to understand not only the geographical setting, but let me ask you, is it important to understand some of the weather, weather padding, patterns of Israel? When you begin to read the story of Elisha and the people were sinful and Elisha prayed and God cut off the rain, it helps to understand the significance of that when you realize that, that Israel, that area, has one rainy season that the people depend on the rest of the year. It fills up their bodies of water. It, they, you know, they schedule their crops around that. And if that rainy season doesn't come, they struggle. It helps to realize that when you understand that God cuts off the rain when they're expecting the rain and they're needing the rain because they're praying to their own God expecting the rain and that whole thing on Mount Carmel was designed to show them that Jehovah God can turn the rain on and He can turn the rain off. He's the one that blesses you with it and He's the one that can take it away and you can cry out to Baal and Asherah and all them you want to do but until God opens the spigot, it ain't going to rain. And, and the neat thing about that is when you begin to understand all these things in the setting of, the, of what's happening, it, it adds to our understanding of the power of God. It helps us understand it theologically. Uh, I wrote down there that knowing this information connects the dots and illuminates our understanding of the events. Another example is Mount Moriah. The first time we see Mount Moriah is Abraham, right? God says to Abraham, take your only son Isaac that I blessed you with, take him up on Mount Moriah, and I want you to sacrifice him. So Abraham takes Isaac up there. He ties him up. Isaac's like, uh, we got wood and stuff, but I don't see a sacrifice. And Isaac starts to catch on. Hmm, maybe I'm the sacrifice. And right before Abraham is ready to kill him, what happens? The angel says, stop Abraham, look. And there's a ram in the thicket and, and he sacrificed that, sacrifices that ram um, instead. That's the first place we see Mount Moriah. Now, in the context of that story, it, it does help us understand obedience and trusting God. But left to that, we may not understand the complete theological significance to it. Now, move forward about a thousand years. The next event that happens right there in Mount Moriah, God has brought a plague on the nation of Israel. And people are dropping like flies. And David repents because he knows it's his fault because he took a census of the people. Because he wanted to kind of trust in the power of his army rather than the power of God. And people are dropping like flies. And David says, hey, this is, I've done this, and so I've got to fix it. And he goes to a man named Arana who has a threshing floor, and he says to Arana, hey, um, I want to buy your, and the guy's out there threshing, plowing, and he says, I want to buy your, your oxen and your wooden plows because I've got to give a sacrifice to God so he'll stop this plague of death. And you remember the story, Arana says, um, here, just take it. And David said, no, I'm not going to offer anything to God that doesn't cost me. And David takes the ox, he kills it, he takes the wooden plows, he makes an altar, he burns that to God, and God stops the plague. Now, move forward a little further. They build a temple where Mount Moriah is. What happens at that temple? on a regular basis. They bring animals to sacrifice to God 
as, as an act of repentance and for the forgiveness of sin. That same place. Finally, what happens in the area right there around Mount Moriah? Most biblical scholars believe that that same area of Mount Moriah is where the temple sat in Jerusalem, but is right there where Jesus was crucified on the cross. Now let me ask you, does understanding the geographical location of Mount Moriah in all of the Bible help us to understand that it was at a great cost God gave His Son Jesus to stop the plague of death and sin and to give us life? You see, when you understand that historical context and that geographical context, man, that just explodes with meaning, doesn't it? And so the physical setting is, is very important to understand. And, and then finally, the cultural setting. The way people lived and their social religious customs of that day. They lived very differently from us. It helps to understand the the religious practices of Egypt to understand some of the plagues and to understand some of the sinful hang-ups God had to get out of Israel before they went into the Promised Land. For instance, why did God turn the river Nile to blood? You ever thought about that? Because Egypt's whole economy depended on the Nile River. Their agriculture depended on the Nile River. Egypt was built in the middle of a desert. It's kind of like, I don't know if you keep up with what happens happening out west, but a lot of the lakes out west, like around Las Vegas and stuff, they're drying up, like Lake Powell. They, you can see pictures where it's dropped like 70 to 100 feet. Well, it's not real smart to build a town with a million people in the middle of a desert, right? And, and so Egypt was in the middle of the desert, but they were smart, they put it on the banks of the Nile. And so they could use the river for um, economic transport, back and forth up the river to other people groups and trade. Every year the, the, the Nile River would flood. They were smart enough, they would cut channels into their fields where when that flooding water would come up, it would irrigate all their fields. The Nile River was the life of Egypt. God said, okay. If you won't cut all, if you won't let my people go, I'll cut your source of life off. Imagine when they went out there and the river was blood, the fish were dead, it wasn't going to be any, they said it ain't going to help the crops. And Pharaoh's like, hey, we'll let them go. Just you know, give us our water back. It helps you to understand those things and, and, and what it means um, to know their gods and <clears throat> that. The idea of Aaron making a golden calf came from what they had watched in Egypt. They were just adopting the ways of the people around them. There's a theological lesson, right? Come out from them and be separate. God is still calling us today to come out from people and be separate this world. And the reality is if we're not careful and if we don't carefully evaluate the setting of our culture today, we can look at our lives and see that we've adopted some of the things of our culture that we're not aware of. So it's very important to understand the setting. Um, Abraham in Genesis chapter 15, as God comes and makes a covenant with him. You remember that strange thing Abraham did? He took a bunch of animals and he cut them in half. And he laid them out on some rocks. Uh, I think he took a, a calf and a goat, just split them right down the middle. One half over here, one half over here. And he went into this sleep and he saw, it was, it was a fire pot that passed between those animals. And you say, well, what in the world is that about? Well, in the culture of that day, if me and Dickie were enter, in, if we entered into a business agreement, if I said to Dickie, I want to buy 20 acres from you, and Dickie, I make a covenant with you, I'm going to uphold my end of the bargain, that within two years, I'm going to pay you back that price. Here's how serious they were about their word. They would take an animal, they'd kill it and cut it in half, and me and Dickie, we would walk between that animal. Basically what we are saying was, 
if I break my covenant with you, this is what I deserve, be cut in half. Now here's what's interesting. Why did only God pass through the animal? Because God's the only one that really can keep the covenant, ain't he? We're, we're covenant breakers. We're sinful. But when God passed through there, he, he was saying, Abraham, this covenant I'm making to bless you and your people and bless the world through you, Abraham, I know you're going to slip up. I'm not even going to ask you to do this. But Abraham, I'm walking through this and my word is truth. We know God really kept that covenant when Jesus died on the cross. So you see how knowing those things really... I mean, if you didn't know that, you might just read it and say, well, that don't make no sense. you know, And you might pass on. But knowing that helps us take it from the then of Abraham to the we and then to, 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 the, to the me to, to understand the depth of the covenant God makes with us through Jesus Christ. And when he says, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you. Well, God, how, how in the midst of having cancer, I know you're not going to leave me or forsake me because I gave my son and I made a covenant and I'm that serious about it. You see, it, it, just, it just helps us understand so much. Matthew chapter 22, Jesus told the story about a guy who was, who was going to have a wedding feast. And he sent out a bunch of invitations. And if you remember, everybody got the invitation, made excuses, they couldn't come. And he said, okay, I'm going to have a party anyway. He said, go out in the highways and hedges. Just invite the bums on the side of the street. And he goes out and he invites them. And the, the, the wedding host, he comes and he notices a man there that doesn't have on the right attire, a wedding garment, right? And remember what he said? He said, hey, Take him, bind him, and throw him out. And that kind of leaves you scratching your head. Well, well, maybe the poor guy just didn't have the clothes at home to wear, so he came with what he had. And why would the guy kick him out? It helps to understand from my study in that culture, the wedding host provided the wedding garments. When you showed up to the party, he said, hey, here's your coat and tie. And so the significance of that is that guy showed up not properly dressed. The host attempted to properly dress him. He rejected that, thought he could come into the, to the wedding banquet his, his, the way he wanted to, and he got kicked out. Now what does that tell us? God clothes us in the righteousness of Christ. We may think we can get to heaven through our good works, by dressing ourselves, but we can't do it. We must receive that free garment of righteousness from Christ that only God can provide. And then we get to be a part of the heavenly banquet. So isn't it interesting? Knowing that one fact about culture, that makes that story beautiful, doesn't it? We don't have to dress ourselves that God dresses us in righteousness to the event He invites us to if we just simply receive it. So, so let me stop there. I'm five minutes late for my meeting. Let me, let me uh, show you there. I wrote down, you say, well, how do you discover some of these, these things? Uh, concordances, atlases, biblical encyclopedias, dictionaries, handbooks, uh, Bible handbooks, and uh, sometimes you'll find books that say like biblical introduction to the Old Testament. In fact, there's one of those courses from Dallas Theological Seminary. So... Uh, Anyway, hey, thank y'all for being here. Hope y'all have a great week.